Chinese did what my uncle did, wanted to do, and did. They, they, instead of projecting military power abroad, they projected economic power. So while we were spending $8 trillion bombing bridges, roads, schools, ports, and airports, they spent $8 trillion building schools, <laughs> bridges, roads, ports, and airports. The China, and they're making friends everywhere. The Chinese are now the principal creditor in almost every nation in Latin America and almost every nation in Africa. And, you know, my uncle did that. He refused to go to war, refused to send any combat troops abroad. He said he wanted children in Africa when they heard of the United States not to think of a man with a gun in a military uniform, but to think of a Peace Corps volunteer, to think of the Alliance for Progress, USAID. And those were programs he created to grow the middle class and run the oligarchies and, those, and the military dictators of those countries and grow their middle class to give aid directly to the middle class. Today, there are more statues to my uncle, more boulevards named after him, more avenues, more universities, streets Air and parks than in, in almost every country in Latin America, Africa, Asia, than, than any other president and probably more than all other American presidents combined. And that is a good foreign policy to have the world actually love you. And yeah. we're gonna get that by projecting economic power abroad. You know, the Chinese want world domination, but they spend a third on their, a quarter to a third on their military budget that we do. They don't want a hot war with us. They want, and I'm not scared about competing with them on the economic landscapes. It's gonna be good for us, it'll be good for them, it'll be good for every country in the world. That's what everybody wants from us. Most of our um, our military spending is, is spent not for self-defense, but to dominate the globe. We have, the Chinese have a base and a half abroad. The Russians have one base, we have 800, and each one is looking for a fist fight. Oh, you know, we need to close those bases, bring that money home, spend it growing the middle class in this country. And, uh, yeah, and well, that's very appealing. Um, apparently, there's been 350,000 Ukrainians who have died at least in this war. And, uh, and there's probably been uh, 60 or 80,000 Russians, and that should not give us any joy. It should not give us any, you know, I saw... Lindsey Graham on TV saying, you know, anything we can, something to the extent that anything we can do to kill Russians is a good use of our money, that it is not. You know, those are, those are somebody's children. They're, you know, we should have compassion for them. Um, this war is an unnecessary war. We should settle it through negotiation, through diplomacy, through statecraft and not through weapons. I was at my uncle's inauguration in 1961. Three days before he was inaugurated as president, John F. Kennedy, Dwight Eisenhower, the outgoing president, gave a speech, in which, the, which probably now should be regarded as the most important speech in American history, where he warned America against the emergence of a military industrial complex that would turn us into an imperium abroad and a national security state at home and put the weapons manufacturers in charge of American democracy. And today that's exactly what has happened. And you know, we are addicted to this pipeline of new wars that are being driven. You look who's who's funding both the Democratic and Republican Party. It's Raytheon, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, and Lockheed. And they need to put NATO in every country in Europe because then that new country has to uh, adopt NATO uh, weapons purchase specifications. And it's a guaranteed market for those countries. It's all a big money laundering project, uh, which you know we need to unleash ourselves from. And then when the war started, um, I was... I was pretty alarmed that the Democratic Party had now become the pro-war party. The Democratic Party was always anti-war. And I saw why it was happening that, you know, their funding was all coming from Raytheon and General Dynamics and uh, and Lockheed and Boeing and Northrop Grumman and BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard, all of these big companies that make they're living, make money, you know, part of the military industrial complex. So you believe that that is the reason that the Democratic Party is pro-war and not because they are trying to defend democracy? Yeah, well, you know, listen, every war says they're trying to defend democracy. My uncle, John Kennedy, the military and intelligence came to him and said, we got to invade Cuba. 
And he was like, I'm not going to Cuba and I'm not going to let the military. And they said, well, we got all these Cubans trained and they're going to go attack Castro. And he said, well, we're, we can't, the U.S. government can't be doing that. We can't be attacking. We, we, I don't like what Castro is doing down there, but the, it's not the United States job to dictate what kind of governments other countries have. For the next 1,000 days of his presidency, he was at war with his military and, and, and intelligence apparatus. They tried to get him to go into Laos. He said no. They tried to get him to go into Vietnam with combat troops. They said that we need 250,000 combat troops. He refused. What his view was is that he believed that the view of Americans should, abroad should not be you know, a soldier with a gun. It should be a Peace Corps volunteer building, you know, wells, and it should be USAID helping poor people, and it should be Alliance for Progress building middle class. The morale within our our military is bad, and I think that just getting in continual wars has been bad for our country. Try to name, Pierce, we've spent $8 trillion on wars since 2000. Name one country that's better off because of those wars. Iraq is worse off than we found it. We killed more Iraqis than Saddam Hussein. We drove, we created ISIS. We pushed Iraq into a proxy posture with Iran. Yeah. We drove 4 million refugees into Europe. We destabilized every country in Europe. We, though you could trace that, a, a straight line to Brexit in England. And then during the Cuban Missile Crisis, what is our moral basis for making a decision that could kill these children so they'll never write a poem, they'll never participate in an election, they'll never run for office? How can we make? A, how can we can we morally make a decision that is going to eliminate life for these beautiful kids? And um, he has said that to to Khrushchev, and Khrushchev wrote them this letter back saying that he was thinking about what my Uncle Jack had said to him at Vienna, and he regretted very deeply not having taken the olive leaf that Jack had offered him. And then he said, you know, it occurs to me now that we're all on an arc, and that there is not another one, and that the entire fate of the planet um, and all of its creatures and all of the children are dependent on the decisions we make. And you and I have a moral obligation to go forward with each other as friends. If you enjoyed that, you can watch the full podcast of the best of RFK in the link up here or in the link below. Do it for the chickens.